a number of issues. And I requested that those issues I should not discuss here. I should take them. Those that need the Minister of Higher Education, I will meet the Minister of Higher Education and raise the matter. And those that uh, need the leadership of this university, I will also do so because as And pensioner, huh? <laughs> pensioner, which arises out of being, having been a president, and now referred to as former. I realize there are many formers that were introduced here. <laughs> so I'm not the only former. There are many formers. <clears throat> I will be able to raise those issues. Because it's absolutely important that the issues that are raised on behalf of the students by our leadership should be attended to. This university is one of those that bear the name of one of the greatest leaders of our country. Utata Utamel. And therefore I want to assure you that those matters will be attended to. So we won't necessarily deal with those matters. I will make my remarks on the issue of fewer education, perhaps at the end just provoke you on few political issues. <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> Comrades, education is very close to my heart. And this has been like that for many, many years. There is a background to it, which I think is known by many. I believe, just like my leader, President Nelson Mandela did, that education is the most powerful weapon one can use to transform and advance society for the good of all. If education is handled properly, it helps to empower nations. It helps to make the people of the world discover the countries, the world, everything. It makes them work out better ways to live as human beings, as the citizens of the world. Education is a powerful weapon that can liberate our country from inequality, economic exclu exclusion, poverty, and unemployment. Comrades, following my first inauguration as President of the Republic, we as government or administration, we declared education to be an apex priority. In other words, we declared it as a priority number one of the five priorities that we highlighted from many things we needed to do in the country. We said education number one. And we repeated that in the second <clears throat> phase of our administration. So to us, education was the main thing to deliver to the country. We decided as well to split the education department into two, basic education and higher education. The purpose was to ensure that we give each phase, 
enough time to focus. Our view was that there is something that needed to be fixed in education. You will recall that almost every other end of the year there was a crisis of very bad results of the, mat of the matric. It was fluctuating. It was a question of good luck. If the results were good. But generally nobody could say this is what is going to come out. And I felt specifically that there was something we are not doing right in education. And I felt that one big department had a problem that people focused in higher education in the main. They started looking at the lower level of education when the kids arrive in matric and only then realize that we have difficulties. And I thought it was important that we establish a basic education so that we could look at the foundation of education. Anything that you build without a foundation, it cannot stand stronger and be clearer where you go. Because our foundation was not firm, the results showed themselves when our kids got to matric. In fact, we were made, as I will remark here, to fear mathematics. No one wanted easily to do mathematics. And it was almost a belief that Africans can't count, can't do mathematics. Yes. This was some other people, not this color. The problem was how education had been handled from the beginning. And we needed to fix that, because without fixing that, we would not have succeeded to develop this country to what it's supposed to be. We did this in terms of splitting the department because of the importance of education as an instrument of freedom and development, prosperity and dignity. A nation that is not educated or empowered cannot walk proud among other nations. When our results were a subject of criticism, it was very difficult to move among other nations. Even nations that we thought were weaker than us, but they produced better results. And I'm happy that now the situation has changed. That is no longer the issue. Because we began to look at <clears throat> The foundation. We even looked at the kids before starting formal education. That by the time they get there, they should be ready. One of the things, and I'm happy that one comrade said this, that we have been saying, we can be trained, be educated to be workers only. But we should be also educated to be the creators of work. In other words, we should be so educated that we don't sit at home if there is no work, that we should be able to create jobs ourselves. And that's what we are looking for. That is we are looking where we should go. And that, by the way, challenges our understanding of freedom and, and democracy and whatever 
if we are to say at the end we are democratic we are a free country what does it mean but I will provoke you at the end about those questions it can also that is education liberate our people from ignorance about the history of their country of oppression and of the heroic struggles that were waged by many heroic women heroic men and women which brought us where we are today there are many at times interpreted by people with regard to our struggle i've heard people for an example saying mandela sold out that's a new history don't you know our mandela never sold out mandela sacrificed more than any other person in the country spent the longest time in prison but also mandela led many struggles where he was chosen and given the opportunity to lead he also advanced great ideas for our revolution now if we are not clear about our own history then that is a sad story one of the key struggles waged was the struggle against the inferior education that was reserved for black people in our country to make them perpetual servants and to ensure that they do not have the tools that would enable them to fight and also take over the running of their country there were many reasons why we were supposed not to be educated we recall the struggles against bantu education when teachers protested against being forced to teach black children that they are inferior we were made to believe that we were inferior some people were saying we are slow thinkers by nature we were made by god to be slow thinkers that's what they said as one of the nationalist party leader said we don't need mathematics where shall we use it <laughs> because the jobs where you use mathematics is not our jobs in 1976 the students of soweto took to the streets and many lost their lives as they protested against the imposition of africans in schools and also unequal education the quality and also access to education had indeed always been an issue in our country we're not getting quality education as sasco has been calling for it because we were black because we were funny people according to other people most importantly for our country has always been the need to open up the doors of learning to the children of the poor many children from poor and working class households have struggled to gain entry into universities and universities of technology because their parents 
could not pay the fees. So if you came from a poor family, you were condemned forever to remain an inferior person. We have seen many young people being expelled from universities because they could not pay. Others had to take up many at the end demanding jobs to obtain money to further their studies. Some universities have decided to withdraw the results of students or withhold the results of students who could not afford to pay, thus destroying many futures of individuals. They were not worried about you as a citizen, whether you'd be able to make a contribution in developing the country. In other words, education had been to some degree looked at more as a business to make money rather than as a thing to empower citizens so that the citizens could help the country to make money for itself. As a patron of the Jacob Zuma RDP Education Trust, I have personal experience of the suffering of young people. They used to come to my house stating their sad cases, hungry for education with good metric results, but no money to study further. It is a painful and a very frustrating situation which a democratic government could not allow to continue without any intervention. If we continued as if nothing has happened, we would not have understood why we fought for freedom. Particularly if you take into account that the Freedom Charter stated that education shall be free, compulsory, universal, and equal for all children. It states that higher education and technical training shall be opened to all by means of state allowances and scholarships awarded on the basis of merit. I would like you not always to bear in mind the Freedom Charter when we deal with the challenges of today and tomorrow. <clears throat> I'd like to draw your attention that the Freedom Charter does not just end with free education. There are two things that come one after the other immediately. Education shall be free and compulsory. We, 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 we seem to be not paying sufficient attention to compulsory. If education must be free, but it must also be compulsory. We should not allow a situation there is a South African who has not been educated. Because those who threw up the Freedom Charter were very wise people on a number of aspects. On this one, education, 
precisely because we were deprived education at that point. That is why the emphasis that education must be free and compulsory and universal and equal <clears throat> for all children. In other words, they knew that the practice of apartheid and racism was actually pulling us back in terms of development. That at some point in the future when we get our freedom, we would not be like other countries. You know people when they talk about South Africa, and I don't want to call them names, because uh, it, it, people feel a pain if I say things. <laughs> because they don't ask me why do you say this. When people analyze the economy, for an example, of South Africa and the countries that are of the same size with South Africa, they criticize us as if we are responsible, we today, since 1994, that's why South Africa has this problem and that problem and that problem. What they forget is that South Africa is the only country in the world that institutionalized racism. Even in countries where there is racism, it was never institutionalized. We had apartheid here, which was the name of this new institution to run countries. Even the whole <clears throat> organization of the world, the United Nations, declared that system as a crime against humanity. Why then, if countries did not have that, they were developing equally, all people. When we are compared with them today, it's as if we have been just free all the time. They forget to say these problems that we are faced with in South Africa are in fact as a result of institutionalized racism. Education is exactly the same issue. If there was no institutionalized racism, we would not have been having these kind of problems in education. It would be just smooth sailing. And therefore, because there was extraordinary efforts to suppress and subjudicate us in every way. We need to take extraordinary measures to correct the situation. We've got to take radical actions to correct the situation. We should not be shy about it. We should say we are correcting the wrong. Because if we don't do so, we are almost like somebody pleading guilty to a crime that we never committed. <laughs> the Freedom Charter, just to digress a little bit, because I want us to bear in mind this document. People who wrote it knew exactly what they were doing. And they knew what problem they were solving. They said, when we are free in a new South Africa, we should nationalize <clears throat> the land. We should nationalize the banks. We should nationalize the mines. We should nationalize the monopoly industry. These were very wise people. Today, in Europe, and your students do the research, there is no country that has a land that is not nationalized by countries in Europe. It's all nationalized. If you want to utilize the land in Europe, you apply and get something that you are given to use the land for a period. They call it leasing. You lease the land. You can't buy it. 
can't buy land in Europe. And people from Europe say to us, we must not nationalize, we must buy our land. They don't do it in Europe. I'm saying this because to you as young people, this debate must be more raging because the reason why we, the blacks in particular, the Africans, are the ones who are poverty stricken, are the ones who, have, who live in informal settlements. The, 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 the basis of that was the land that was taken from us. That made us overnight to be a poverty stricken nation. And we have got to argue for the land properly. Not the way at the moment we are arguing about it. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, don't want to be something else. <clears throat> the African National Congress, the ruling party, had made several commitments to ensure that the Freedom Charter Proclamation is implemented to enable our youth to gain and education. We took too long to, to implement this. We took too long to implement this. And yet, was is one of the key deliveries we should have done as early as anything. Our youth, when <clears throat> we worked on this, was beginning to lose heart and was beginning to be impatient and frustrated about the issue of education. The government funding schemes, scheme, the national student financial aid scheme played its role and kept on increasing each year during the past two administrations. However, it had its problems. It was not solving the problems. Whilst it was established to solve the problems, it began to have its own problems. Students complained that NESFAS funding is guaranteed for one year and in the following year students have to fend for themselves. And we kept on increasing NASFAS into huge sum of money but the problem remained the same. It became clear that NASFAS on its own was insufficient to cover the needs of students from poor and working class households. It is for this reason that we decided that the time had come to implement what the Freedom Charter said and open the doors of learning to our youth, especially those from our poor households. If a child passes matric well, why must he or she stay at home simply because the parents or guardians are poor? Why were we condemned to this situation? We the blacks, in particular, the Africans. 
It was during this time that I called a meeting of the student leaders, university leaders, <clears throat> governing bodies, parents, to discuss the matter. At that time, the campaign <clears throat> fees must fall was on. And it was clear that the students had taken a decision that this country, this country must ban rather than leaving this problem unresolved. We had a long discussion at the union buildings. That discussion ended up at a point where there was no agreement. It was clear to me that many people, whether it was a department, whether it was the students, whether it was the universities or the institution of higher learning, whoever had their own views and had proposals to make, but were not solving the problem. I was very clear that we need to go into the details to find the problems and then work out a solution. I then established a commission of former judge Hare. We have an individual. Yape puk. Yape puk. Mbalunga chavele gil. <laughs> uh, it became very clear when the commission reported back with many recommendations I think we took many recommendations but there was one key recommendation. How should education be financed in our country? There are details. I'm sure you have read the report. It was clear to me that the recommendation, the key recommendation, was creating a new situation in the country. That every young South African, by the time you start working, you must be owing the banks already. And I thought that, that was an impossibility. That's, 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 a, that's a total <clears throat> meaning of, 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 of what that key resolution was. <clears throat> and I felt no. Not when people who lived many decades before us said education must be free. We wanted it to be even more expensive. Then I set up two committees of government. One, to look at all departments and a number of things. One, look at the finances. And they finally reported back. And I announced free education on the 16th of December, 2017. As the President of the Republic, but also, as a member of the ANC that organized the Congress of the People, wherein we emerged with this particular policy on education, as a person who fought, who went to prison, who suffered for this, and I felt if I did not take this decision. Those who were with me over the years 
will call me names when I find them in heaven. <laughs> because they will say, many of your comrades, never president, very few, you became a president. You had a chance to take this <clears throat> country changing decision. Why didn't you take it? I don't think I'll have an answer. And in my colleagues here, I said, this is what we need to do. I need anybody to convince me this is wrong. I am convinced this is right. And it is right. After several meetings at which we discussed the matter, a special ministerial <coughs> committee had been set up to explore the issue of free higher education and another <coughs> committee was established called the Presidential Fiscal Committee because I wanted it to leave stone and ten on this matter. I was tired of many ideas that were not solving the problem over a period. Both these committees processed the report and we finally arrived at the final decision. I announced that government will subsidize free higher education for poor and the working class students. We said the definition of poor and working class students will now refer to currently enrolled <coughs> TVET colleges or university students from South African households with a combined annual income of up to 350,000 by the 2018 academic year. We also changed the definition. There was a very funny thing that we worked on. We were told there are people who fall through the tracks. And we're trying to look for these people who fall through the tracks. We did not find them. There were things that people were not scientifically counting. For an example, the fact that the development and the value of the money keeps on rising all the time. However, we dealt with those details and therefore took the decision <clears throat> very much against many, but it was important to take the decision. And I will never regret that I was one who led the government when that decision was taken. Absolutely necessary. Alone, I think it corrected almost more than a quarter of our history. Having amended the definition of poor and working class students, we indicated that government would introduce fully subsidize free higher education and training for poor and working class South African undergraduate students starting in 2018 with students in their first year of study at our public universities. In other words, because we did not have sufficient money. We couldn't say 2018, we are starting everybody now. To me, it was important to establish this as policy and to make a beginning of implementing so that we don't have people saying we can't implement, we don't have the money. To say, let us start with the first years, 2018. Let us phase it in. An important feature is that students 
categorized as poor and working class under the new definition will be funded and supported through government grants, not loans. Black students had complained about being indebted at an early age in their lives, having to finish studies to begin paying the loans. We also announced that the technical and vocational education and training uh, colleges would be fully subsidized within five years. Also important is the announcement that previous NESFAS uh, previous NESFAS loans for existing students and those returning this year would be converted to grant. The apartheid government had used education as an instrument to oppress our people. They used it to subjugate black people and keep them in perpetual bondage and servitude. We did not want to continue doing that. We wanted to cut that one off. We needed to break this cycle. And breaking it required that we take the bold step to announce free education to free black youth from the exclusion based on the fact that their parents are poor. <clears throat> President Oliver Tambo said the children of any nation are its future. And I quote him, a country, a movement, a person that does not value its youth and children does not deserve its future, unquote. In other words, whether you are building your future or not, you are judged by how you handle the young people as a nation. By declaring free education for our children, South Africa has decided to invest in its future and to invest wisely. Many were critical of this move when it happened. However, decades from now, people will look back and say, it was one of the best decisions of this time, as it is a decision that will ensure that South Africa takes its place among the top nations of the world with an educated youth and population. <laughs> Education is power. Education will open many doors for our youth. Education will take us to prosperity. That is the Freedom Charter talks about. Let us celebrate free education by encouraging our youth to study and gain the qualifications that are needed to grow our economy and achieve economic freedom. The radical economic transformation that we talk about will be achieved better and faster with an educated youth that will be able to run 
the country. The doors of learning being opened to the youth, we say, pick up the spear, learn, and ensure that South Africa succeeds as South Africans. Be proud of yourselves. And I must tell you, you must never allow opportunity to be misinterpreted and to be taken away from yourselves. <clears throat> Free education is our policy and it must be implemented. Although faith in, but it must be implemented. As a person, and I, I, I say this to people who never received any education, I came to appreciate the importance of education, perhaps more sharply. And that's why I believe in it, and that's why, to me, even if you left all other services, you just dealt with education you would have delivered more than half of what needs to be delivered. Education will always change the life, the quality of lives, and make people different. The problem that faces us today is a result of our history. Precisely because the school was denied from us. You ended up with young people drinking, just killing themselves with drinking, going for drugs, the appreciation of life being distorted. And you cannot allow that. I believe you should be on the forefront to implement compulsory education. <clears throat> I've always said, if I could be given an opportunity just to make one law on my own, I will make a law that any young person who is found walking around during school time will be committing crime, must be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> committing crime against himself or herself and against the country arrested in prison in prison those who will be arrested like that they will be a special prison they will be forcefully educated forcefully They will only leave prison when they've qualified. So that when they come out, they are useful to their families, to the society. Absolutely. I'm sure we are agreed. We can make that law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Comrades. Before I sit down, I said I will want to provoke you at the end. Because you are young people, you are students, you are political. I've listened to you this afternoon. Very able leaders. Even those who didn't talk, I could see. They can see their way where South Africa must go. Now, I get worried if at a level of South Africa there are things that we can distort and they become a fact when they are in fact necessarily not a fact. <clears throat> I'm 
I'm sure you know English. I don't know English. I don't know. <laughs> what is a state? Who can help me? What is a state? Huh? I don't hear the response. <laughs> no, fine, 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 fine. Though I'm sure you will agree with me. As far as I, I, I know, maybe from uh, political, if I don't say uh, from English point of view, but political. A state is composed of three elements, right? It is the, f the uh? <laughs> legislature, ne? right? Executive, right? And judiciary, agreed? That constitute the state correct yes. agreed now for my man so let me ask the question if that is the case what is this thing called state capture state capture does it mean these three arms have been captured huh? is it true huh? just explain the truth about it huh? is it true we have a commission that is sitting, investigating the state capture. Is the state captured? Eh? <laughs> My view, and I'm not disagreeing with anyone, these are political decorated expressions. Absolutely. There's no state that is captured. Even when people try to describe it, worse when they give evidence. There are some people who are doing things with other individuals. Not a single one of the three is captured. Judiciary is not captured. Is it captured? Is parliament captured? Is the executive captured? So where is the state captured? Where is it? Now, as students, why don't you debate these issues? Why do we just swallow? Just swallow anything that people say. This is a politically decorated expression to achieve something I don't know. I mean, I will challenge anyone. There is no state capture in South Africa. There are people who did things to others in one form or the other right and you can call it in any, in any other not this big name state capture mm -hmm. <laughs> now i'm talking to students now i want you to educate me because i never went to any school i'm just saying please <clears throat> please politically let us not swallow anything that is given to us why don't you argue? Students research and argue. Huh? You even look at the dictionary these days. Google. What is the definition of freedom? Who can define freedom to for me? What is freedom? 
Okay. I will I will talk to the leadership at the right time about it. Now I'm saying this because I have a view that our freedom is not complete. We, but we call it freedom as if it is complete. For an example, colonialism. Colonialism. Some country in Europe sent a journalist long before the Berlin conference to go and investigate what is in Africa. A journalist discovered that this continent is very rich and its wealth has not been touched. That partly influenced a conference of countries from Europe who met in to discuss dividing Africa among themselves, the colonization of Africa. And thereafter they came to colonize. What does colonization mean? Huh? It meant that they would come, find a piece of land, take it full control, its people, everything. If it was found by the British to be British colony, to be part of British, by France to be part of French, by Portuguese part of Portugal, not so. We then started to struggle to decolonize ourselves, correct? I have a belief that in the process of our fighting, we narrowed the meaning of decolonization. We only look at political decolonization, not economic decolonization. We are still colonized economically. We have not yet decolonized ourselves economically. They came, colonized, made the laws which protected their companies and everything. And we are so afraid of these laws. Why can't we change this? We take these laws that were made by the colon colonialists as if they are equal to the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Absolutely. They take our wealth every day. We are looking at them. We are poor. We are, we are just something else. We have not yet decolonized ourselves sufficiently. That's a matter I'm raising with the AU because they are supposed to do so. We are supposed to make the laws to decolonize ourselves. So that we have our things. Anyone who has our gold, silver, whatever, must talk to us. We, we, we starve. All the wealth is making people, other people rich. Poo poo, pass up. Same thing again. Let me raise one other issue. What is the understanding of democracy? Democracy. Aren't we saying the, the, uh, the main feature of democracy is majority rule? In other words, those in majority rule. Right? Where, where do we get, where do we exercise this in reality? We then have a system to have parties which present their programs and policies to the majority, to the people, and the majority elect a particular party. Not so. And that party becomes the government. In other words, <clears throat> democracy is exercised in parliament where decisions are taken by a party that represents the majority of the country. And that is supposed to be the final decision. But in the process of our negotiations, and I'm provoking you, 
<laughs> there are two, you know, there are democracies and democracies, by the way. Right? There is what you call it, what I'm talking about now. In other words, parliament takes the final decision. It's called parliamentary democracy. Agreed? But when we concluded our, not our negotiations, because that must be clear, it was not CODESA. CODESA only worked on an interim constitution to make us cross into the government of national unity and said that the constitution will be drafted and finalized by members of parliament who, when dealing with the constitution, they will convert themselves into a constitutional assembly. And the chair will chair, the speaker would not be there. Those are the people who made our constitution. Instead of making it a parliamentary democracy, our democracy, they made it a constitutional democracy. Agreed? What did that mean? It meant that parliament does not have the last word. The majority does not have the last word. You take a decision, an NGO takes you to the constitutional court, and the constitutional court says your decision is in unconstitutional. So you don't have the majority rule. Is a matter I believe we need to debate as students of history, student of politics. Think about it. The difference between constitutional democracy and parliamentary democracy. There are many things we need to fix in this country, but we'll talk about it. That the balance of forces. Who could tell me about the balance of forces globally, continentally? and nationally. Huh? We'll talk about that one day. I'll, I'll visit for you. I'll invite myself for that. <laughs> what does BRICS mean in the context of the balance of forces and other issues? Again, I'm not going to say much. I was just provoking you on these matters. Absolutely important as comrades who must be active in politics. <clears throat> Very soon I'll be talking to a party that talk scientific politics. <clears throat> Not long. And I'm going to be saying things that must make young people <clears throat> understand better where we are and what needs to be done. When all said and done, education is the base for us to appreciate, to understand the world we live in, to understand the country we live in, the continent we live in. It must help us. If education does not help us to understand that, then it should be a funny education. The real education should help us to appreciate where then we should go. Therefore, as South Africans, we should know where we must go, how to govern our country. It's absolutely crucial. That's why, to me, education is critical. It empowers you to have the capacity to change the world. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the opportunity, comrades. Amanda! I will go! Um chenewa, mim chenewa! Um chenewa, mim chenewa! Um chenewa, mi wei baba! How lit to um chenewa, mim chenewa! Um chenewa, mim chenewa! Um chenewa, mi wei baba! How late um chenewa mim chenewa um chenewa mim chenewa um chenewa mi wei baba.
Now, you've been watching former President Jacob Zuma addressing Sasko members uh, at the Walter Sisuli University Auditorium in Mtata, giving a lecture on free education there, finishing as he did so many of his speeches in the past with that iconic song, Mshiniwam. He spoke about uh, after his uh, first inauguration, uh, education was a top priority for him, and that uh, one of the reasons he decided to split the departments of education into two was so that education could be fixed, especially building a strong foundation. And he spoke about the plight of many students from poor households who, who struggled to get into university because the parents couldn't afford to pay the fees. And other that were expelled uh, because they, and had their results withheld because they just didn't have money. He, he spoke about the Freedom Charter and said that it doesn't end with just the word education. It says uh, it shall be free and compulsory. And he lamented that not sufficient attention should be uh, is paid to the word compulsory. The former president also said that uh, we cannot allow a situation where there is uh, a South African who is not educated. He added that extraordinary measures should be taken to correct the education situation. He also said that radical education uh, uh, needs, uh, he says that uh, he sh sh we should not feel guilty about uh, radical education. He felt that if he did not take the decision that he did on free education, uh, those uh, that are in heaven would haunt him saying, why didn't you take that country changing decision at the time, insisting it was the right decision. And he says that he will never regret uh, the that he is the one who led the government to take the decision to implement free higher education. He said that people who look back and say that the implementation of free education was the best decision of its time. And he said that radical economic transformation will be achieved better and faster with educated young people who will run the country. And then, of course, he had to f end, I guess, uh, with the issue that's uh, gripped the nation at the moment, and that's state capture. And he asked, is Parliament captured? Is the judiciary captured? There is no state capture, he says. There are people who did things to each other. That doesn't mean that the state has been captured. Educate me, he says. I didn't go to school. I'm saying politically, let us not swallow anything that's given to us. And students, well, you can research today. You've got Google. What is the definition of freedom? And that was former president Jacob Zuma addressing students at uh, Walter University, Walter University in Mutata. And that's where we're going to leave it. For